Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, we're talking all about ancestor altars and how you can set one up for yourself. As the spooky season approaches and Halloween draws nearer and nearer, the veil between the physical and the spiritual planes becomes thinner. It becomes easier for us to connect with spirits of all kinds, including ancestors. And so during this time of year, we'll often find that more people are wanting to connect with their ancestors, and so many want to set up their own ancestor altars as a way of venerating and giving them offerings. It is important to remember though that ancestor altars aren't solely used within witchcraft. They're found in many different traditions, cultures, and belief systems around the world. And these different traditions are going to work with their ancestors in different ways, and they're going to be leaving different offerings and setting up altars in different ways. If you would like to learn a little bit more about these different techniques, I would recommend deep diving into your specific tradition or culture to see if there's any kind of ancestor work that you can draw on if you do want to take it a little bit further. And the last thing I want to touch on before we get started is that ancestors and ancestor altars aren't solely for Samhain. They aren't solely for October, Halloween, and the spooky season. Ancestors are constantly there. They aren't just for Halloween. A bit like dogs aren't just for Christmas. So if you do want to form deep connections with your ancestors, you're going to want to be working and connecting with them all year long, not just over the course of the 30 days on or around Halloween. The first thing to think about when you're making an ancestor altar is why you're making one. The primary reason why many people make an ancestor altar is to act as a place of remembrance. It's a location that you can go to to see photographs, memorabilia, items, and remember the people that you've lost, whether they be family or friends. It's an area of remembrance, an area where they still are alive in your space, even if they are no longer around physically. This for many people is separate from witchcraft, and it's found within many different traditions around the world. There are other reasons why you might want an ancestor altar. You might want a space where you are able to give offerings to the dead that you've lost, whether they be the known or the unknown dead. You may want a space where you can commune with your ancestors, where you can undertake divination alongside your ancestors, and in some cases where you can ask for their aid in spell work, ritual, and everyday life. It's important to remember though that you cannot just go around demanding help from people who maybe don't know you that well. If your primary reason for creating an ancestor altar is to get them to help you, that probably isn't going to be the best approach. Ideally, you're gonna to want to be connecting with your ancestors first and then asking for assistance second. You wouldn't go up to someone that you barely know and demand them to help you. It's really rude. The same applies in this sense. So just make sure that you're going into this with the right thought process. The second thing that you're gonna to wanna to think about is how much time and how much space are you going to be able to commit to your ancestors? Many people will have a space for their ancestors permanently, but not everyone has the luxury or the living environment to be able to do that. If you live around people who aren't open or accepting to your practice and your belief systems, or you're in a space that's very cramped and very small, you might not be able to allot an entire table or even an entire shelf to an ancestor altar. It might need to be something temporary, where the altar is there short term, but the honoring is happening all of the time. This is very much an option that you can do. You don't necessarily have to have a physical altar space set up 24 seven. As long as you're remembering your ancestors and you're continuing to connect and work with them, even if the altar isn't set up. That way you aren't simply setting up an altar and then tearing it down at the end of a month. Really, the amount of space that you commit is gonna depend on you and your circumstances. It can be an entire tabletop, it can be a cabinet, it can be a bookshelf, it can be a small side table, it can be a shoebox. Anything that you have access to is better than nothing. Just make sure that you're not shortchanging yourself in the process. Don't set up your dining room table as a permanent altar if you know that you're going to need it later and then you're gonna to have to clear it all off again. Ideally, start small and then expand from there. That way you know exactly how much space you're probably gonna need going forwards. It's also a good time to think about how you're going to be working with your ancestors and how much time you're gonna to wanna to be spending there. If you're planning on sitting with your ancestors in silence or in quiet contemplation for 15 minutes to an hour every few days, you're not gonna want your ancestor altar in a space that's difficult for you to access. And you also might want some kind of seating arrangement if you are gonna to want to be sitting or lying down during the process. All these things are important to consider beforehand. 
The next thing is to think about who it is that you want to be connecting with. There are several different options here and you can mix and match depending on your circumstances. The first kind of ancestor you might want to connect with are the known dead. These are the individuals that you either knew personally or you know information about. The known dead don't necessarily have to be your ancestors. They're simply people that shaped you and who were significant within your life. This could be your blood relatives, but it could also be close friends, it could be adoptive family, it could be step families, it could be the family that you've chosen instead of the family that you were born into. Essentially, this kind of altar is set up to honour the people that were close to you, that shaped who you are, that you've now lost. And these are people that you know information about. So this could be your best friend that you lost. It could be your adoptive father. It could be your great, great, great grandfather, as long as you know information about who they are. This could be photographs. This could be their name, their date of birth, tidbits of information that you've maybe gathered from other members of your family or friends that then makes it easier for you to connect with them. The known dead are one form of ancestor that you can work with. The other are what's known as the unknown dead. These are the people in your bloodline that you know must have existed because you're here, so they have to have come before you, but you don't necessarily know anything about them. And ultimately, their details and their information have been lost to time. You can work with these as well, though it's often done in a different way. You can also mix and match the two so that you can work with both the known and the unknown dead. It's just the way you do it is going to be slightly different. And it's important to note here that you don't have to work with every single ancestor if you don't want to. There are many people who don't feel comfortable working with ancestors because they would be directly opposed with what you're planning on doing and or they simply weren't particularly nice people. And so that's okay too. If you don't wanna work with those ancestors, you don't have to. Once you know the kind of ancestors you want to work with, whether they're people that you knew personally or the unknown dead, you're going to want to be thinking about the things that you can use to represent them on an altar space. Now, how you do this very much varies depending on the known and unknown dead. So we're gonna start with the known dead. Ideally, wherever you've chosen to set up this altar, you're going to want some kind of protective cloth. This is mainly just to stop any offerings or any candle wax from damaging the surface. I personally prefer using black velvet for an ancestor altar, but really go with whatever you feel most comfortable with. And actually, with the known dead, you might be able to choose something that's really appropriate to who it is that you want to connect with. The known dead are fairly easy to work with. They're very close to you. You know quite a lot about them probably, and you know the things that they like and the things that they don't like. So if you knew that your grandmother always had a red and white striped tablecloth, if you can find a material like that, you can use that as the base of your altar to act as an extra bit of connection. For the known dead, you're going to want to be adding things that represent the people directly. This could be photographs, items that belong to the people. It could be little voice recordings, signatures, any pieces of information that you can use to connect to them. It might be artwork that you knew they would have really liked or photographs of places that you knew that they loved. It could be a picture of where they used to live, postcards that they had sent you. Essentially any item that was handled, owned or represents that person can be added onto that altar and you can have different items from different people added onto that space so that you can collectively work with them on that ancestor altar. When it comes to the unknown dead, it's a little bit more difficult. You probably know nothing about them. At best, you might know vaguely where they came from, especially if you've done something like Ancestry DNA or 23andMe. You might have some idea of where the bulk of your ancestry came from, and you can then work with that going forwards. Generally though, you still need something to represent your ancestors, and you might be thinking, how on earth am I meant to find something to represent people I don't know? The simple answer to this is the human form, primarily the skull. Now I'm not saying that you should go out and find yourself a human skull. Firstly, it's often very illegal. Secondly, you're more likely than not going to be connecting with the spirit of the person whose skull it is, rather than the spirit of your ancestors. So ideally, you're going to want to find a replica skull, something that is fairly accurate, 
product and not overly ornate. Halloween sections of stores are often really great to find these kind of replicas. Ideally, you just want something that's anatomically correct. The simpler, the better. I myself have a fake copper skull, so it's just like a plastic skull that looks like it's made of copper, that I will use in these kind of ancestor workings. There are many other things that you can use as well, including skull candle holders, photos of skulls, or skull candles, which are one of my personal favourite techniques. The idea behind using a skull is that it represents something that all humans have. It is that physical representation that links all of us together. No matter who they were, more than likely they're going to have had a human skull. And so this is used on that altar as a really basic representation. There are also many cultures and traditions that believe that the soul or the spirit resides within the head and that spirits are able to communicate through skulls and skull imagery. And so skulls are really good for connecting and communicating with ancestors and spirits who have passed over that were once human. It's a little bit more difficult if you're wanting to work with spirits that are non-human and using a human skull, but that is a completely different topic. You can also add onto the altar things that represent where your ancestors came from if you do know that. So if you know that your ancestors came from a specific geographical location, you might want to do some research on the colours, the music, the food of that particular area so that you can then progress forwards when you are wanting to do offerings or you can add things onto that altar that you think they might recognise. This could be photos of landscapes, things that were probably almost the same when that ancestor may have walked the earth. Obviously things will have changed, but the earth is very, very old, and so oftentimes geographical structures, although they might shift and alter slowly over time, they're going to look largely the same as they were before. You can also add on rocks and other items that you've gathered from specific locations if you do know that that is where your ancestors came from or would have resided during periods of history. Generally though, I typically stick to human replica skulls as I find it's something that all ancestors find fairly easy to communicate through and interact with and it's generally just a good representation for both the known and the unknown dead. So you have your altar set up. What are the kind of things that you can do with that altar? Well, the first thing that's probably the most common is to give offerings. Now, the kind of offering that you give is going to vary on how much information you know about that person. So if you're wanting to give an offering to your Auntie Doris, for instance, and you know that Auntie Doris absolutely loved a really strong cup of tea and a biscuit, that's the kind of offering that you could give for Auntie Doris. But if you know that your Uncle Mick really, really liked brandy, or even better, a particular brand of brandy, you can give an offering of a small amount of that brandy. His favorite kind. If you know that they really liked a specific perfume, fragrance, incense, or type of candle, then you can use that as an offering. If you know that someone's favorite food was something in particular, like Yorkshire pudding, something like that, you can use that as an offering on that altar. But there are some generic offerings that you can give that are good for working with all kinds of ancestors, both the known and the unknown. Incense is a really common offering, as many people believe that the releasing and the burning of that incense stick transports it into the spiritual planes. You can also give strong alcohol, things like vodka, brandy, whiskey, things like that. They tend to evaporate fairly quickly, and the idea of this is that as it evaporates, it transports itself into the spiritual plane and acts as an offering. You can also burn candles or specific candles that you've dressed and anointed for that particular purpose. And you can also give food. Some people will also leave water on their ancestor altars so they will replenish their water on say a weekly basis, same time, same day, every week. They might give food in the form of a small amount of what you're already having, or you might cook food specifically for the altar, place it on the altar for about 24 hours, and then ideally compost it or put it in a food waste bin. What's gonna happen is that the spirits are gonna draw the nutrients out of that food, and you're probably not gonna wanna eat it after the fact. And you'll often find many accounts of people leaving food on altars and then leaving the same food somewhere else in the same room and finding that the food on an altar will rot and go bad or will simply dry out considerably faster than the food that was left elsewhere because the spirits are drawing on that energy. They aren't gonna be consuming the food, so don't expect that your plate of Yorkshire puddings are gonna disappear by themselves. That would probably be a sign of some kind of rodent issue, but energetically they are taking that offering and they're gonna be using it in the spiritual plane. Ideally, you are going to want to have a time frame for when you give offerings. This could be once a week, once a month, 
once a day. It's really going to depend on you and how much time you have spare and how much you're able to devote to your ancestors and your ancestor altar. I would recommend minimum once a month, but obviously I understand that people have commitments that maybe are out of their control. Things happen and it's not always easy to stick to a schedule and that's the bonus of being open and communicative. I would say though, at least once a month give an offering, set a timer on your phone if you need to, to make sure that you do it, say the first of every month or every Monday morning or every Sunday night or whatever it is that you want to do. And when you set that time, make sure that you stick to it. If you've made that commitment, make sure that you are there. Otherwise, when it comes to them offering you help, if that's something that you're after, they are probably not going to be there for you either. There are other things that you can do with altars though. You can undertake spirit communication. And this is where the skull really comes in handy. The skull is often used as a way of communicating to your ancestors. It also gives you something to talk to. Oftentimes people will feel really uncomfortable just talking to thin air. They feel like they're being silly. Whereas if you have a physical human representation on that space, it gives you someone that you can talk to and ultimately you're talking to your ancestors through that skull. If you know your ancestors, a good thing that you can do is to say hi to them every time that you come in or say goodbye to them every time you leave the house. If you're going to go to bed, say goodnight to them and say good morning to them in the morning. This is a really good way of starting that communication. You then might want to interact with them and reminisce with them. You might want to talk about people or events that both of you remember or things that you know of that maybe you would like to know more information about. You can enter into trance or meditative states around your ancestor altar and you may find that while you're communicating with them, they in your altered state of consciousness may be able to communicate back through you. You can ask if they can give you signs and communication in dreams as well. Just make sure that you're keeping some kind of dream diary or journal so that you can keep track of it. Ideally, you're going to want to be talking to them. And this can be the unknown dead as well. Saying good morning or good night to the unknown dead is a really nice thing to do generally. And you might find that communication with the unknown dead is a little bit trickier. You might want to be talking about seasons or the weather or things that you know that they're going to resonate with. I know that it might sound silly talking to a plastic skull about the weather, but really, especially if they live in an area where the weather was very variable, that's something that they're going to connect with. Even if you don't know anything else about them, you know that they've probably experienced hardships because of the weather, because of the heat, because of the snow, because of the rain, whatever it is. And you can talk to them about it. You can talk to them about the landscape of the places that you've seen and simply start a conversation with them. You may then find that in your dreams, your meditations, your trance work, you're going to start getting images, signs, things about them that maybe you didn't realize before. And ultimately, you might find that the unknown dead become the known dead the more you know about them. You might find that they give you their name, that they give you information about them, and you might start connecting with them and even be able to find them on family trees and genealogy websites so that you can get even more information about them. The one thing I will say though, is take everything with a pinch of salt. Don't take everything that they say as gospel because just because a human spirit can come through that skull and come into your dreams, it doesn't mean that other things can't as well. So make sure that you're being extremely critical with every bit of information that you're getting, especially if it's something that you can't verify. Alongside dreams and meditation and trance, you can also undertake divination through cards, through pendulums as well is also really common. The idea here being that the ancestors can connect through you to the pendulum to give you the answers that you need. They're essentially using your hand as a conduit to their energy so that they can then manipulate the pendulum. Slightly different when you use tarot, but essentially you are asking them to communicate through you, to tell you when to stop shuffling, to tell you which cards to put down. They're essentially using your hands and also the cards as the vessel to their energy in that instance. This is often done on top of or just in front of an ancestor altar. Which one you choose to do is going to vary depending on your ancestors. For me personally, I've always done it in front of an ancestor altar because some of them don't like me messing up the altar with a bunch of cards with illustrations that they don't really like the look of, but that is an entirely personal preference on their part. In some cases, you may then also want to work with the ancestors in spell work and ritual. You may find that there's a particular kind of working that they ask to help on or that you might need their help with. 
This is where constant interaction and offerings really comes in handy. As I mentioned earlier, you wouldn't ask someone for a favor if you've never spoken to them or interacted with them before. They're going to say no. But if you're interacting with your really close friend or your parent that you interact with all the time, they're more likely going to offer you that assistance, especially if they know that you're going to respect them and give them something in return. The ancestors can work in the spiritual plane in ways that we cannot. Much like familiars or servitors, they're able to work differently than we will. Therefore, you can ask them for their help within certain circumstances, particularly those that require the spiritual plane to be used extensively. This could be to find information, or to assist with your working energetically and spiritually while you work energetically and physically. You can ask ancestors to do the entire working for you, or you can incorporate their energy and their knowledge and their abilities into your particular working, and they should ideally be getting a really good offering in return. And by doing this, you're further building that connection. You're showing that you're willing to give, not just take. You're gonna wanna make sure that you're being respectful, that you're not asking for something that they're not gonna be comfortable with, and that you are giving something back in return. These are all things that you can do on your ancestor altar, whether it's temporary or whether it's permanent. You can bring out that altar to give offerings and to connect with them, and then you can put it away again. As long as you're being kind and genuine with the things that you're doing, you're not just shoving them to the back of your bed and forgetting about them for six months, you can do this in a temporary space and you can do this in a permanent space. You can also work ancestor altars with multiple members of your family if that's something that you're interested in, or you can just do it as an individual, that is fine too. There are so many different options when it comes to ancestor altars, but the one thing I will reiterate is come at ancestor altars with the best intentions. Come at it with the goal of connecting or reconnecting with the known or the unknown dead. The goal here is to form that bond, to deepen that connection connection, whether that is simply for your own grieving process, whether that is to connect with them spiritually for religious reasons, or whether that's to connect with them energetically as a practitioner. The one thing I would never suggest anyone doing though is just jumping in and start demanding things, because that's when you might find that things start going wrong. Just because someone is an ancestor doesn't mean that they're oath-bound to be nice to you. You might find that if you insult your ancestors, especially if you have an altar set up that they can work through, you might start getting bad dreams, you might start getting really weird meditation visions or trance journeys might be really strange. You might find that the electrics start going or things start going wrong. It's because they're trying to tell you they are annoyed that you're ignoring them. So as with all other spirits, if you open that door, be respectful about it. Make sure that you are not just ignoring them. And if you come to a point where you no longer have the time to give them, tell them. Communication is really beautiful and it's really important in all relationships. Whether they are platonic, romantic, familial or ancestral, you need to have respect and communication. And so talk to them. If you're no longer able to work with them and give them the time that you promised them, be honest about it. Tell them why you are struggling. And they might respect that you're struggling and understand the situation, or they might even help you out in that situation so that you can continue to work with them. The goal here though is to be genuine and to be honest about it. So hopefully this guide to ancestor altars was useful. I would love to know how you set up your ancestor altars and how you work with your ancestor altars if you do use them yourself. This will help give me and probably lots of other people more ideas and different variations of how you can work with ancestors and an ancestor altar. If you did like this video, feel free to give it a like. It really means so much to me. And it also helps to share and promote this video for other people who maybe want to learn more about ancestor altars for themselves. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, or just want to chit chat with the community, feel free to put it down in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel or in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. So with that being said, I hope you have a marvelous magical day and I will see you in the next video. Bye. This is a very wide frame. I feel like I should have zoomed this in a little bit, but we're here now and I suppose it gives me the space to put things on the screen if I if I want to do that. Okay. Bye. Oh, can't forget this. Ta -da! Okay. Can I do this in one take? Have I got this on the right way around? I hope so because I don't want to have to take it off again. 
Hey everyone, I've got a hair in my mouth. That went well, didn't it? <laughs> Almost instant is a hair in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, so it's hot. 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 As the spooky season, as the spooky season, as the spooky season, as the spooky season. Hmm. Nope. This is going well. I just said the intro like five times. Okay, again. Let's do this again. The intros are by far the hardest thing to do, by the way, for anyone who is interested in making their own YouTube channel. The intros, by far the most difficult thing to do. You spend like 25 minutes just trying to get the intro right. So the next time you watch a YouTube video, just assume that they did like 15 to 20 takes just on the intro alone, and you're probably pretty close to what it actually was. Hey everyone, 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 as the spooky season gets underway, as the spooky season gets underway, and we're getting, as the spooky, no, I need to start this again, we're trying this again, this jumper is kind of itchy. Mm -hmm.